Hi, welcome back to the Grammar Park channel. This is Sharonisha. In this session, we are going to see the part 2 of the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Before getting into this topic, please like, comment, share and subscribe this channel. Our previous session describes about the life of Chaucer and the introduction of this work prologue to the Canterbury Tales and the knight and his son Squire, Yeoman and the prayers. If you want to know our previous session, please see the link I have given in the description box. Another nun, or she is also called as a little nun. The prioress had another nun with her. She was her chaplain. Chaplain in the sense, a clergyman or clergywoman in charge of a chapel. And here she is assisting the prioress. And the prioress had three priests with her. Our next character is the monk. Monk is a leader in fashions. Inspecting forms and hunting were his passions. He is a manly man. He might have been able to abort or the head of his monastery. He had many horses in his stable and when he rode, his bridle jingled in the whistling wind. So bridle in the sense here, it is a headgear for a horse. Whenever the rider rides, the, rides on the horse, he is controlled by the headgear or bridle. The bridle makes sounds like the chapel bell or the church bell. So this monk works as a keeper of the cell in the church. He ignored the old and strict rule of Saint Maur or Saint Benedict because he considered them as old and somewhat strict. This same monk considered old practice as something old and outworn or outdated. He preferred to follow the new world's more spacious way. The monk did not give importance to the written text. If it is the written text, the value of a plucked hen is described or the text that says hunters are not holy men or that a monk spending even a little out of his time outside the cloister. Cloister in the sense a monastic establishment or a church. Yes. The monk being outside of the church is considered to be like a fish out of water. So completely the monk did not give any importance to any kind of texts. And the Ch Chaucer also agrees his opinion, the monk's opinion. He also asks why should he study and make himself mad by studying books within the church. Here Chaucer talks about Saint Augustine. Saint Augustine is a theologian and a monk and also he spent his time in the church by reading the texts. So Chaucer asks why the monk should be bored, getting bored in the church so he can go for some hunting, some riding. Thus Chaucer agrees with the monk. The monk had greyhounds as swift as birds in flight or running. All his pleasure was in hard riding and hunting of the hare, for he would spare or spend no cause for it, so he loved it very much. Presently, Chaucer describes about the monk's dressing sense. He saw, Chaucer saw, his sleeves were garnished at the hands with a fine grey fur. So garnished in the sense that is trimmed or ornamented at the edge. And it seemed to be the finest one in the land. In order to tighten his hood under his chin, he had a golden pin beautifully fashioned and there was a lover's knot at the larger end. His head was bald and it shone like a glass and his face also glistened as if it had been anointed, smeared with oil. He seemed to be a fat and impressive priest. His bright eyes rolled in the head. And his eyes was like a fire of a furnace of lead. His boots were made of soft leather. His horse was in a fine state. Now, suddenly he might pass for a stately prelate. Fine prelate in the sense that he was a carefree priest. He was not pale like a tormented soul. It means that is he was not so poor like a wasted ghost. And he liked the best a roasted whole swan. And his horse was as brown as a berry. Our next character is the freer. He is also called as the Vanton freer. He was a wanton and merry fellow. So wanton in the sense that it is the cruel or violent. And he was a limiter. Limiter in the sense here, he got license to beg within a certain district 
to beg for alms and a very important man of all the four orders there was none who knew so much of flattery and glib speech it means good speech and he had performed the marriage of many young women at his own cost he was a noble pillar to his order he was highly beloved and familiar with the franklins everywhere in the country and also with the esteemed women of the town yes chaucer here mentions that he was familiar with the franklins and with respectable women he reflects more of worldly spirit than of holy living the friar was qualified to hear confessions as he himself said with more than priestly authority that he had a special license from the pope he heard confessions pleasantly and pronounced absolutions he was an easy man in giving penance for thereby he could hope to make a decent living for as he thought to give freely to poor order this is what the sign of that man is well observed what is the friar comes to say is if the penitent who worries for his offense is given freely he could boast that he knew the man to be repentant so there is many a man so hard of heart and he cannot weep even though he feels pain keenly or sharply therefore instead of weeping or praying praying in the sense here he mentions as confessing one ought to give a silver to the poor friars so his bag was ever stuffed with knives and pins to be given away to good women certainly he had a merry voice he could sing and play on a harp he always bore away the prize in songs and tales now chaucer talks about his appearance his neck was the friar's neck was as white as lily his neck was compared to a lily flower and moreover he was as strong as champion which means he seemed to be a strong man and he was well acquainted with taverns it means bar in every town and with every innkeeper and barmaid better than with a leper or a beggar woman a worthy man as he was it should not his position to have an acquaintance with sick lepers it was not respectable it might not promote his interest to have dealings with such poor people but with all rich people and the sellers of provisions and most of all where it was profitable he was courteous and humble in service in such matters there was no man anywhere as capable as he he was the best beggar in his monastery though a widow had not a coin to give him he was so pleasant but however he got his poor thing from her before he left her the shoes the word shoes represents the coin and the principio represents the saint john's gospel it is in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god this is what the saint john's gospel so he read the opening verses of saint john's gospel so pleasantly so that he would not depart without a farthing from the poorest widow so however he got the coin from the widow so it is very clear how he lived by begging and his income in this way was much more than his regular wages yes he made much more money than he declared to his friary and he could romp as well as any whelp whelp in the sense that it refers to a puppy he could behave wantonly right as a puppy on love days could he be of mickle help love days in the sense that it is the days for the friendly solution of quarrels yes on love days he could be of much service he was not then like a poor and humble friar ragged clock such as a scholar or but he behaved like a lord or like a pope now chaucer talks about friar's dress of double worsted as his semi cope that rounded like a bell as you may guess semi cope in the sense that is the short clock it was of double worsted that his short clock which stood out round like a bell out of the mould he lipsed somewhat in his affection to make his english sound sweet in his harping when he had sung his eyes twinkled right in his head as the stars on a frosty night this worthy friar was called hubert 
So finally we got that Freer's name is Hubert. Next character is the merchant. The merchant had a forked beard and he was dressed in multicolor and he sat on a high on a horse and he had on his head a Flemish beaver hat. His boots were fairly and neatly buckled. He expressed his arguments solemnly, talking always loudly of his increasing profit. He wished that the sea between Middleburg or Orwell were protected against any hostile action. Well, he could deal in his French crowns for a profit to himself at the exchange. This worthy man employed his intelligence to the best advantage and no man ever knew that he was in debt for he was highly dignified in his management with his bargains and money lending. So he was the money lender. Chaucer don't know his name but he tells truly that he was a worthy man. Our next character is the clerk. He is also called as the clerk of Oxford. He had long devoted himself to the study of logic. His horse was as lean as a rake. Here, rake in the sense, a garden tool to sweep. So, here the lean horse is compared to a rake and, and Chaucer says that he too was not at all fat and had a hollow look and a sober stare. So, he was looking sad and quiet. His overcoat was worn out and he had not yet got an ecclesiastical living nor was he so worldly minded as to have an office. The clerk would prefer to have by his bed his 20 books of Aristotle and his philosophy. It was bound black and red rather than rich ropes, fiddle or a merry harp. But although he was a philosopher, he had but little gold in his money box. All that he could get from his friends, he spent on books and on learning. And he earnestly prayed for the souls of those who gave him the means by which he could carry on his study. He was extremely careful about his studies. Not one word did he speak more than was necessary and it was said in due form and with due reverence and it was short and alive and full of deep meaning. His speech was always filled with moral excellence and he would gladly learn and gladly teach. Our next character is a surgeon of the law or surgeon at law. He was a wary or prudent. It means showing care and thought for the future and wise and was who had often been at the church porch. Church porch in the sense a room over St. Paul's porch. It means a resort for lawyers. He was richly gifted, he was profoundly wise and was held in great reverence, at least he seemed to be so. His sayings were so wise, he often had been a judge at the sessions of the court by letters patent. Letters patent in the sense granting of a property right and also in full commission. Because of his knowledge and of his high renown, he had earned Plenty of fees and robes. Robes in the sense loose outer garment. So great a purchaser was never known. So he was a great buyer and he would have no entail on the property. Entail in the sense limit of inheritance. He bought the properties so that his purchase could not be held invalid. There was nowhere so busy man as he was. Yet he seemed busier than ever. He could deal in most precise terms, precise terms in the sense exact terms with all cases and legal decisions recorded since the time of King William. Moreover, he knew how to make up a case so that nobody could find fault with his case. He knew every statue by heart. He wore a homely party colored coat, grit with a belt of silk with the small strips on this it. This is what Chaucer tells about the surgeon at law. Our next character is Franklin. Franklin was also there in this company. His bird was as white as a daisy. Already we have a comparison like this that Freer's neck was as white as lily. So we have to keep that in mind. Franklin was ruddy in complexion. For his breakfast, he loved well a cake dipped in wine. 
His habit was ever to live a life of pleasure, for he was like Epicurus' own son. Epicurus is the Greek philosopher who taught that pleasure is the highest good in life. So he wants to be live like Epicurus' son. And he held that sheer sense was pleasure was truly perfect bliss. He was a great householder. He was like Saint Julian in his country. The legend Saint Julian was once hunting a stag. The stag is nothing but an adult male red deer. It prophesied that he would kill his father and mother. In order to evade the fulfillment of this prophecy, he left his country and married abroad the rich heiress of a castle. Once when he was away, his parents visited the castle and entertained by his wife. On his return, he got suspicious and slew his parents. When he discovered his mistake by way of atonement, he found a hospital and he came to be called Hospitaller or the Good Harborer. So like St. Julian, that the Franklin was very much good at the hospitality. His bread and ale, in the sense wine, were always of good quality. There was no lacking for baked meat in his house and he had a, such a plentiful stock of fish and flesh that food and drink overflowed in his house. All dainties that could one think of, how according to the various seasons of the year, he altered his food and supper. He had many fat patridges, patridges in the sense that is a kind of birds, in the mew, mew in the sense that is a cage or coop, and many breams and loses. The breams and loses all kinds of fishes in the fish pond. And if the cook is in trouble, if he is in trouble to cook, and the sauce was not pungent, pungent in the sense that it is highly flavored and sharp, sharp in the sense that it is hard. And if the utensils were not ready, his table was always fixed in the hall and stood steady covered all the day. The sittings of the law court, he was lord and acted as a judge there. Often he was the knight of the shire. A knife and a purse made of silk hung at his griddle, which was white as morning milk. His occupations are that he had been a sheriff and an accountant. Nowhere was there such a worthy person among landed gentry. Thanks for watching and let us continue the remaining in the next session.